Welcome friends to another r slash pro revenge video. If you want to join me in getting revenge against the YouTube algorithm, make sure to hit the like and subscribe buttons down below. That said, our first story of the day is by top of the morning. Neighbor took my parking spot after I shoveled. I poured water in his windshield. It was a cold winter day. Eight inches of snow had fallen the night before, and the windshield made it feel as if it were in the negatives, Fahrenheit. I drive an all-wheel SUV, so I have no issues getting out. My wife, on the other hand, drives a Prius, which slides with the smallest amount of moisture on the road. My car was down at the time, so we had to take my wife's car. I spent 45 minutes in the freezing cold shoveling that car out so we could get to the store. We were gone for an hour, and when we came back, our neighbor had taken the spot I had shoveled. Our apartment complex doesn't have assigned parking, but in the winter, it's understood that if you shovel a spot, it's yours. So when I saw his car in the spot I had just shoveled, I was pretty pissed. I went inside and filled two gallon jugs of water, went back out, and poured them on his windshield, rinse, and repeat. I must have poured about 10 gallons of water on his car. Being how cold it was, it was already freezing by the time I poured the last gallon on. It sat like that overnight. The next morning, I got to watch as he helplessly tried to scrape all these layers of ice off his windshield. Don't take my god darn parking spot. Do you think if there is an unwritten code at this apartment complex that if you shovel it out, you own that spot or are entitled to it more or less? That what OP did here as far as freezing this guy's windshield with layer after layer of ice is fair? Or do you think it was a bit extra for OP to go and do that? Let me know what you think in the comments down below. Our next story is by BaliMeh93. Made my former boss jump through hoops for nothing. Used to work as a CVS pharmacy technician. At the time, I was studying for board exams to get into residency. I graduated medical school abroad and need to pass board exams to get into residency to practice medicine in the US. Last year, because of COVID, my last board exam was postponed one week before taking it. It was rescheduled two weeks later. It was the only time slot available that would let me apply to residency within the time limit. Problem is that I couldn't find anyone to cover my pharmacy shift for the rescheduled date. I told my pharmacy manager and she told me that it was my problem and I had to find someone. I was a part-time tech making less than what the job was worth, but it got me by, so I endured knowing it was only a temporary thing. Anyways, come exam time, I couldn't find a replacement, so I was like, screw it, and missed my shift to do my exam. I get to work the next day, and she fired me on the spot, even though other people she liked more missed days all the time and no punishment ever happened to them. It's no issue, because I managed to get into residency across the country. I moved there and no regrets. Now the petty revenge. She called me a few weeks ago and asked if I was interested in coming back to work. Apparently most of the techs they hired quit three to four weeks into the job because of the horrible work environment, because of customers and other staff. She has no idea I moved to another part of the country. I was about to say no, but the devil in me made me say, sure. I asked for a higher salary though, and she said she'll talk to her district manager and get back to me. A few days later, she called me and said that she pulled a bunch of fevers and got me a $5 raise, per hour obviously. She sounded desperate, poor thing. I told her to shove it. I was in residency, living my dream, while she's getting yelled at because the coupon for Kit Kat bars wasn't working. She began to yell at me. I just hung up and laughed my butt off. I'm pretty sure almost everybody's gone through a situation where they had to deal with somebody that was over their head that later on they wish they could just look down at their puny being and laugh once they finally break through that ceiling and they're doing well for themselves, while that person that was lording over them before is probably still lording over peons but is now in a much comparatively lower position than you. This next story is by Nam, gifting my ex's dog loudest squeaky toys I could find. So I and my ex-girlfriend dated for about 8 months. Overall, our relationship was good but towards the end of it we both started to realize that we too aren't really compatible with each other. Our relationship probably wouldn't have lasted this long if it wasn't for her dog. An adorable golden retriever whom I absolutely love. I was more excited about meeting the dog than meeting my ex during the last days of our relationship, and I think even my ex realized that. About a month ago, my ex decided to call it quits and break up with me. 
I was kind of glad, but also was upset because I don't think anyone likes being dumped. A week ago, I got a text from my ex where she invited me to her dog's birthday party and also asked for my help to arrange it, which I gladly accepted. While shopping for some of the supplies for the party, I found one of the most loudest squeaky toys I have ever heard in my life. They are so annoying and maybe even give you a headache. So I decided to buy two of them. On the dog's birthday, I gifted her these toys and played with her for some time. She was extremely happy and excited for these toys and also ignored all the other gifts she had gotten that day. Yesterday at about 2.45 AM, I got a text from my ex with just three words. I hate you. I am so happy right now. Now, I am a devout dog lover, I adore dogs, I care for my dogs, but am I just not like, wide enough to have a dog birthday party? Am I not basic enough? What, what, when do you have these dog birthday parties where you go out and get supplies for them? You probably get little party hats you put on them. It sounds really cute, but it sounds like kind of a lot. Either way though, an ex with a dog that you adore deserves a really good toy that is really annoying. Our next story is by TX Rude Boy. Annoying cheater got caught. This was years ago. My annoying coworker was cheating on his wife with another coworker. They stupidly exchanged work emails throughout the workday, and it annoyed me because he'd been getting behind on team projects by focusing so much time on the other woman. One day, his wife came in to meet him for lunch, and he didn't lock his computer. He stepped away, probably to go tell his other woman he'd be with his wife for lunch, and left his wife at his desk. She asked me if it's alright if she goes onto his computer to browse on the internet. I said, sure, no problem, and joked, you should check his emails. I peeked back and she had his outlook opened and was reading through emails for what seemed like five minutes before he came back. When he did, she punched his arm several times and called him a jerk and other names. They walked out and he didn't come back that afternoon. Some time passed and I was mentioned that they're getting a divorce. He was now openly dating the other woman who was also living with the father of her child. It was an office scandal and they fired her and him. All because he and her were cheating jerks. And I made my short comment. I feel like this dude was kind of asking for it, blatantly cheating out loud at work. This dude was playing a dangerous game that was bound to explode in their face one way or another. If you're going to be dumb enough to cheat, why would you also be dumb enough to do it so blatantly that your coworkers can catch on? And then when you bring your wife to the office where you're doing your cheating talks all the time, leave that place where you're doing it unsecured. Like, maybe this guy wanted the wife to find out so he could get out of it. This next story is by Runs With Scissors. Don't call me on my rest period. I feel the story in real life a few times in different contexts, and enough time has passed that I feel comfortable posting it online. I've worked in live theater for my entire professional career. For the most part, I've specialized in video, which is a pretty niche thing. Not a lot of people that are drawn to live theatrical performance are at all interested in video. I was working at a large regional theater company as a video engineer. Said company got lucky enough to be the place where a show destined for Broadway would originate. This show's received a decent amount of fame. Not like Hamilton, but you'd probably have heard the name if I said it here. The show had a lot of video. Like, a lot. Specifically, it had around 30 flat screen TVs that were part of the set. They'd fly up and down, move across the stage, and display all sorts of content. We brought in a Broadway designer and his team of assistants to produce all the content. I worked most closely with the video engineer attached to the project, a New York City based guy. We'll call him Chad. It was a big show for my team. The scope was completely out of our usual wheelhouse, but we had a lot of talent on our side. All of us put in some insane hours. Me and one other person had a couple of over 100 hour weeks during the build and load in. I in particular didn't get a day off for around a month, I think 29 days. It was a big show and we were all exhausted. Once we were in technical rehearsals, the large part of my job was over. Most of the time, I was expected to be on site in case anything went wrong. In general, I'm totally fine with this. It's part of the job. We got to a Wednesday night, right at the end of that 29 day period. I realized I literally didn't have a clean pair of underwear to wear the next day. I talked to my boss at the theater company, local, and his boss, also local, and they gave me the okay to go home to do my laundry. I'd be back the next day at 8am. 
I went to let Chad know what the plan was. I explained that I needed to do laundry and that I hadn't had a day off in a month. He sighed, exhibiting extreme annoyance and disappointment, and said, I just want you to want to be here. Well, freak you too, Chad. Seriously. He knew how hard I'd been working. He knew how much I'd been there. He knew there wasn't anything for me to do that evening. He knew that if there was a technical problem, he was more qualified than I to address it. He knew all of those things and didn't care. That was the moment any ambition I had to work on Broadway died. I had put my heart and soul into that show and had a relationship fall apart as a result and he wanted me to want to be there? Side note, theater people can be really toxic about this kind of thing. If you aren't there every waking hour, people will turn their noses up at you. It's the one thing I hate about theater, that there's this cultish sense of a required level of devotion, that if someone treats it as a job and not a calling, they don't deserve to be there, which is BS on many levels. That said, if anyone is in the condition I was in, the hours and the lack of days off, Usually they'd be escorted out of the building by their co-workers and have their keys taken away until they get some rest. Theater people can be cultish, but they do care about one another. Chad's actions were on a whole different level. There was no immediate reprisal. We got through the technical rehearsals and the show opened. Then it closed and moved on to NYC for an off-Broadway run before it got to Broadway and received much critical acclaim. The revenge story comes with the move to off-Broadway. See... I was the person responsible for boxing up all those TVs to send to New York City. This particular model of TV has a big rocker switch on the back, a master power switch. Knowing Chad, I knew that wouldn't be something that he'd check. So I went ahead and flipped them all off, packed up the TVs and sent them on their way. A friend of mine worked on the production in New York. Apparently, Chad got his crew to hang all the TVs and fly them up into position without checking anything. Apparently, Chad had spent a couple days trying to turn them on, with remotes, with network control, even getting on an electric lift and hitting the power button, separate from the rocker, nothing worked. Huh. Apparently, when he found out the problem, he was rather frustrated. Apparently, he'd been putting in some long days and hadn't had a day off in a while. Well, Chad... I just want you to want to be there. Just imagine somebody putting in hour after hour after hour, week over week, getting to the point where they have no underwear to wear because they've been working so hard. All they're going to do is go home to clean their clothes, then they're going to come back, and that's when they have to say, I just want you to want to be here. Maybe OP should have asked Chris if it was okay to just kind of fester with the skid marks. Maybe ask Chris if he wears nothing but brown underwear because he doesn't have enough time to go home to clean his clothes because he's been working so hard at the theater. No, they have it? Okay, well, OP's gonna go clean their clothes and they'll be right back. And our final story of the day is by Griselda Loves Cats, Petty Revenge on Catholic Father-in-Law Father-in-law and I have never gotten along. We're pleasant and polite to each other when we see each other, which is rare now. After hubby and I had been married for five years, father-in-law started whining about how we were living in sin. Because I refused to get married in the Catholic Church, I am vehemently not Catholic after years of Catholic school. Hubby was Catholic, and we respected each other's religious choices. Father-in-law did not. No one talks back to father-in-law because he is the authority in his mind. I don't care that father-in-law was a high school football coach and thinks he's the authority over everything. Most of his authority comes from being a high school football coach. I was not in high school at the time, and I was never in football. I actually hate football. Just listening to it makes me irritable. It has no place in my mind. So, being a football coach gave father-in-law no influence with me. Father-in-law is very into being Catholic. Good for him. I don't believe in organized religion, so going to all the classes and being confirmed, etc., just to get married in a religion I don't believe in, wasn't going to happen. Hubby was perfectly fine with this and with not raising our kids in any specific religion, but especially not Catholic. The kids did go to church, including mass for a while, but they did not have any one religion pushed on them. Early in our marriage, father-in-law used to go on and on about how we were not really married because we didn't get married in the Catholic church. He finally got on my last nerve with it when my oldest was about three. The next time we brought it up, 
I told father-in-law that at least I was willing to marry a B word that stands for child born out of wedlock. Father-in-law got angry at the B word and asked what I was talking about. Before father-in-law and stepmother-in-law got married, they spent eight years waiting for the Pope to annul father-in-law and mother-in-law's marriage, which left my husband and his sister as the product of unwed parents meaning they are B-words in the original sense of the word. Father-in-law had no idea how to respond, so he yelled for stepmother-in-law to come and deal with me. He never knows how to deal with me. Sucks to be him. Honestly, the reason father-in-law doesn't know how to deal with OP is probably because they're so used to being the final word because they have that influence over their family. With OP's husband or OP's sister-in-law, the father can be, I'm putting my foot down, I'm your father and you've got to listen to me, I'm a football coach. And the kids are probably like, yes sir, I'm sorry sir, probably intimidated or stressed out. Doesn't matter to OP though, there's no power dynamic there. Good on OP for standing up to it. But with that being said, that's all the time we have for today. So of all these stories I've read today, which is your favorite and why? Let me know in the comments down below. And if you haven't yet, if you could like and subscribe, that would mean a lot to me. Whatever you do, whether it's liking, subscribing, turning notifications on, all of it helps grow this channel and I appreciate the heck out of it. So until next time, I'll see you all tomorrow with some more stories.